Well, hey, he ain't got the KYKX big bass bananas oh, on. Wow. He does got the KYKX shirt on. Look at him. He's serious, serious big bass tournament. That's a fun tournament there. Sure is. Yeah, this is a fun one. We have the Skeeter Owners Tournament yep. starting tomorrow. It starts tomorrow, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, Saturday. Yeah. I lose track of my day sometimes. I should know it's Friday because we're only here yeah. on Fridays. But sometimes at the end of a long stretch a of days long, on the water, man. you can uh, have a little meltdown in your brain, and that's what's going on with me right now. So, uh, Skeeter Owners Tournament. We're here at Lake Fort Marina, the host site of the Skeeter Owners Tournament for 2019. We have a huge crowd in attendance. Yep. Y'all make some yes. water quick? Make it look. Make it look. Hey, there we go. Awesome. So, hey, we appreciate each and every one of you guys joining us tonight. We're going to do the best we can to help you guys have success this weekend. How many people are fishing the owner's tournament? Pretty much everybody. <laughs> almost, <laughs> almost every single person in here. Awesome. Who's, who's not fishing the owner's tournament? There's a few. Are you guys fishing for it tomorrow? No. Okay. <laughs> Good. I want to make sure there wasn't any lunatics smart. in the crowd tonight. No crazy people need to go to the asylum or anything. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's great. So all you guys, good luck. And for you guys, this advice is going to pertain to really all the lakes around here. We're going to talk yep. about offshore structure fishing. Ronnie's going to talk about the bait that's kind of working the best right now. And I'm going to try to help you guys identify different species of fish on your graph the best I can without being in a boat with you. That's kind of, it's really it's best. It's tricky. It's hard to do without looking at the graph and showing you, but we're, I'm going to do the best I can to talk you through it and demonstrate it with my wonderful art skills tonight. So I guess first thing we need to kind of talk about this next giveaway contest yep. that we're going to do. Yep. I know we've talked about this for a while. We've been wanting to do it. Um, what was the dates that we had lined up? We had uh, two dates. I got, I got them right here. Hold on. Let's see. We've got uh, Wednesday, June 19th, Wednesday, June 26th. Um, those are the two options for this giveaway. What we're gonna do is we're gonna give away a day of fishing with me and Ronnie. So me, you gotta be in a boat with both of us though. Me, you, and Ronnie <laughs> in the may same may boat for a day. Well. Uh -oh. Yeah, me, you, and Ronnie in the same boat for a day. We're gonna go out. We're gonna film an episode that's gonna go on our Facebook page and our channel. And the way that you can win this, guys, is we need you to go onto the social media outlet of your choice. It can be Facebook, it can be Instagram, or it can be YouTube. And we need you to like and share. The seminar post so i'll post the seminar on facebook and i'll post it on youtube uh so it can be instagram i'll take that back it can be instagram it has to be facebook or youtube right. but you can we need you to like it and share it to your social media outlet of choice uh, from youtube or facebook and that'll automatically enter you into the contest and then we'll draw to see who's going to go fishing with us and i don't even know if that's a good prize i it might be punishment people pay to go fishing with us though that's the weird Which part. is like the biggest scam I've ever had going on in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them are here. Agreed. A lot of them are here. Uh, <laughs> Let's see. Uh, we got that one and that one yeah. and that one. And yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. we have a no refund policy, which is a huge deal. That's a big deal, putting that no refund policy on there for me and you for sure. Yeah. All right. So, uh, I guess let's get into football jigs, right? That's what we're going to talk about. Uh, uh, I figure right. everybody start clapping there at football jigs. Football jigs? Let's, let's talk. Yeah, so we'll talk football jigs. Um, is I'll that kind you. of the deal that's working the best for the big fish right now? What do you think? I don't know. Um, for me and my boat, we're catching a lot of fish on a football jig. But I know this. I know that any kind of a big bluefield, bluegill crawfish imitation bait, I think, is working really well, as, as well as a bait fish imitation. So I'm fishing offshore. I'm starting my mornings out fishing um, anywhere from about – um, I've got some, some spots that I'm 12 to 14, 15 foot of water, but most of my fish are, are coming out of that 20 to 26 foot of water. Um, and I'm throwing uh, two or three baits throughout the day. I'm still cranking some. I'm fishing a lot of areas that have a lot of uh, timber. Uh, I'm still looking for areas where fish are transitioning. There are a lot of fish at Lake Fort that are just now moving off the banks. Uh, we're catching, yesterday especially, we caught some just absolute scissor belly bass. I mean, they hadn't. You know, when you get out on this offshore stuff, especially uh, those big crankbait fish that I was catching, a lot of them, uh, people are asking me if they're still pre-spawn, and they're not. And you can tell that they're beat up a little bit, tails are a little bloody, but they're just huge. And that's because they're down there gorging. Um, and I think by this time, we're starting to get bluegill. The crankbait bite has been really, really good. At this point, the bluegill have kind of started to move out, so we're starting to see some bluegill offshore. Uh, and you'll see some bluegill pop up every once in a while. I think bass will hit them. A lot of times bass, when that bait's dead, they're done. Like you'll see, if you see a bait fish floating on top of the water, 
that means something didn't want to eat it, right? And so bird and turtles are going to eat that. And so we're starting to see some bluegill in some areas, and you see them on the graph. And Billy and I just filmed a video. We saw some bluegill. Um, How many people saw the video on Monday where we went over that kind of shallower part of the ridge, and we Ronnie saw the bluegill beds, and then we turned around and we sat there and we caught almost every fish in the video off that spot. How many people saw that and went fish that spot? Because there ain't been nobody over there. <laughs> And now it's like everything. No, I'm just kidding. So, anyways, <laughs> but there is there's some bluegill beds, and you can see the bluegill set up, and the bass are sitting over there. And um, uh, there's a lot of bass over there. But anyways, the the bluegill are starting to make their way out offshore, and um, we're we're kind of catching the bass down there, kind of really feeding up. And they're starting to get fat. But like I said, there's a lot of fish that are just now moving over there, which means that the spawn drug on a lot longer than I think any of us really. I, I personally know of a guy that was catching some good fish off beds last weekend. Last weekend, yeah. So it caught eight six and a five. Yeah. Eight eight sixty six over. Which means there's still some fish up there guarding fry. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good point. Yeah. So I'm starting my mornings out and I'm throwing. I'm throwing a, my my primary bait is a football jig. Now I'm also mm -hmm. throwing big perm, big shaky head worm. Um, big perm um, is a smash tech magnum yeah. crawler on a big six inch shaky head. It's that a five eight ounce shaky mm -hmm. head seven knot hook. Yep. I'm throwing that uh, mixed in. But my primary bait and the bait I want to talk to you guys tonight about is a football jig. Um, I'm going to take the two football jigs that I'm throwing. These are my two absolute favorite colors. I fish Lake Fork a lot and I fish Lake Falcon a lot. Before he gets into this, if, peop if enough people would pick it up and leave it in their hands, I feel like this would be my number one pick to win this tournament this weekend is this bait right here. It could definitely. It catches I mean, a big definitely. old fish. Easily. I mean, I had a... 15 year old girl catch one almost 10 pounds two days ago on this thing and it would it wouldn't have just been an over it would have just ate the overboard it would have just ate up 24 inches but these are the two colors that i'm throwing this is a santone three quarter ounce football head jig and it's got a really beefy hook are you gonna put it in the camera mm -hmm. so that's pinto beans and carrots and it's kind of a play off of peas and carrots any of you guys have been fishing a while remember the color peas and carrots which was a green and orange this is brown and orange and pinto beans are Brown. And that's Mexican Heather. And that's, these two are my favorite. And they're both really good bluegill imitation baits. We're going to pass those around. Um, I'm throwing a three quarter. You can throw a one ounce. And if I'm fishing over 25 foot of water, uh, I'm probably going to throw a one ounce bait just to give me a little bit more feel on the bottom. Um, but I'm, I'm staying in that, that 20 to 26 is about the deepest I'm throwing that bait. So, so I'm all right. Um, but I'm putting a, I'm putting a crawl trailer on it. That's a smash crawl. Those two colors you got you got pinto beans and carrots, which has got orange in it, and it's got some purple in it. And then the other color has got some chartreuse and some purple and stuff like that. They're both great bluegill imitation baits. And all, not all bluegill are the same color, and I think that's why having both of those tied on is a really key deal. There's times where we catch fish out of the same school on both of them, and there's times where one of them just seems to do a little bit better than the other. Um, one thing you're not going to notice on that right there is, again, it's a green pumpkin smash crawl, and this is a hot bait. And this is a hot, this is a bait that I can tell you several guides throw. I know you throw these colors, um, yeah. made a little different jig, but there's a couple other guides that are friends of mine that throw this exact bait, and they have huge success. And this is a this is a Lake Fort deal, but this is also a great bait at Lake Falcon, um, in Palestine, and pines. Rayburn, and Toledo, and Pines. <laughs> that uh, yeah. pinto beans and carrots is a really good color at Pines. Um, and I don't think colors necessarily. I, I think with still. a jig, any type of green, brown, orange combination, yeah. and, and that, anywhere in the country is always a good color. Of course, that orange and purple is a big deal because our bluegill have a lot of orange and purple in them. And I don't. That's true. I think bass see orange, purple. I eat orange, purple, and they just eat it. You know, so I don't think they're necessarily down there licking on it, sniffing on it, checking it out that close. But I think when they see that, it triggers something in them. On the Mexican heather, I like to put a little bit of chartreuse on the on the pinchers. Um, and I just think maybe sometimes if, if that little bitty uh, subtlety makes a difference and it catches me one more fish or one big fish, then it's worth it. Um, I'll, I'll show you guys my setup for that rod, for that bait. I'm throwing the same setup. I've got, I keep five or six of these rods in my boat. This rod right here is a Kissler rod. Um, I don't think brand's a big deal, but this is a 7.6 heavy action rod. Um, and it's an extra fast rod. And it doesn't have a whole lot of tip, but I'm throwing... 20 pound fluorocarbon and you can get away with 17 pound fluorocarbon as long as you're dragging it and you're not a lot of, around a lot of timber i'm around a lot of timber and i'm fishing it two different ways and we'll kind of talk about that uh, when you a, said it it doesn't have much tip you mean it's stiff all the way it's, through the tip. it's pretty stiff it's this is this is an extra fast rod 
Um, but it but it it loads more like a moderate, um, which means that the, the tip's a little bit slower. You know, when you're looking at extra fast rod like my frog rod, the, the rod seems to taper a little bit. This rod's got a little bit more of a moderate bend, but it loads up well and it allows me to make a long cast. And of course I need a long rod because I'm fishing at 20 to 26 foot of water, making really long casts. Um, uh, the presentations that I'm, that I'm throwing, I'm, I'm dragging this jig a lot. Now, there's three different ways to fish a football jig. You can drag it, which is just a subtle, and I, and I keep my rod tip, but you see a lot of people dragging to the side. That's great, and that's awesome. You're gonna get hung up a lot. I drag mine up, okay? And the reason I drag it up is that's gonna come up, and that rod, that rod tip's gonna pull it up over any kind of timber. And if it does get stuck, I can just kind of shake the rod tip, and if I can't get it out of that way, I can just pull the line and pop it out. And most of the time, and Michael, Michael will tell you, the guy that fished me this morning, most of the time when this jig, big three quarter or one ounce jig gets hung in the timber, most, eight out of 10 times you can pull it out, especially if you got that rod tip up. Now I'll drag it, just make short, short little drags, not doing much. I want this head to go across the bottom and I want those pinchers to kick. Um, and then I'll stroke it. And so I want to talk to you guys about stroking a jig. So this is one of my favorite things, quit laughing. So this is one of my favorite, it's not funny. Maybe a stroke you. <laughs> stroke it to the east, stroke it to the west. So, anyways, so this is one of my favorite ways. Jig is so fun. It's, it's so one of my fun. favorite ways to, yes. to fish, and you're not real good at it because I saw it on the video. <laughs> Remember, I caught all the fish stroking, and you're like, "Man, I want to catch him on a stroking a jig," but you didn't. So I was just throwing that out there. Remember, you caught him. Why trying to make me look bad? I didn't really even throw because the jig. I threw the jig like two times. Like we got everybody to see. Look trying out. to make me look bad. But he couldn't catch him. But he couldn't catch him stroking. Two casts. You're right. In two casts, I didn't catch him stroking. But, but I after I picked him. up the jig, you didn't catch him more than the jig either. So. But I, I probably did. Know. I just don't remember. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm gonna. The make camera my, didn't remember either. Just saying. I'm gonna. Will you edit it all? Like these folks don't know that it took us three weeks to film that show. I couldn't even shower. I don't so, know how it takes three weeks, but we have a show every week. But I like that math. It works good for me. So I'm going to make a really long cast at my at my target area. I'm going to let my bait fall on slack line so I can watch it fall. Now, I've had several times this week where my bait's never made it to the bottom, which is why I think it's really important to watch that line fall. Um, and something else that I do that, that I think is good to know, um, you make your long cast. you got a long ways to go. you got 20 foot of water. That's from the trolling motor to the big motor. So that, that bait's got a long ways to go. So as soon as it hits the water... With my thumb loosely on the spool, I'll just pull my rod tip all the way up, letting all that line off, and I'll just follow my line down. So as my line's going down with a good bow in it, I'm watching that line go down. So if something hits it, I click the handle, pull up, and set the hook. And again, I've had probably four or five fish this week between Monday and today that have hit the bait before it's ever hit bottom. So that's a big deal. So especially if it's a big, big fish. Um, so I'm, I'm following that. I'm following that jig down with it with a good bow in my line because i don't want to put any tension on that bait i want my bait to fall straight down and not pendulum down if i throw it out there it hits the water i click the handle that bait hits the water and it swings i want that bait to hit the water and go straight down so i can work it and keep it in the strike zone more so it's going to hit the water i'm going to fish my rod right here at about one or two o'clock i'm not going to put it down i'm not going to reel down to it i'm going to fish it right here and get my line tight now i like to use two hands because they got little hands and they're not strong some guys can kind of do it with one hand. I like to use two. I just put my hand kind of right here. You know, if my reel's out of the way, I put my hand right here. My, my rod's at one o'clock, two o'clock. I drop my rod tip straight and I pop, just like that. And then I let that jig fall and I kind of watch it. And as it's falling, I'm keeping up with the slack just a little bit to have that same bowing line. And as soon as it hits, I see it line stop. I drop that rod tip back down and I pop. So I'm not doing this. I'm not, my bait hits the water, which is what we all do. And guys, I'm in the boat with somebody seven days a week and I see everybody's natural tendencies. And we tend to do this. We make a cast, we make a cast, it hits the water, we reel down, we drag, 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 or we drag, 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 but we drag and we reel down. And we drag, right? That's what everybody does. Most of the time you fish a text rig or you might kind of hop it or whatever you do. So on this deal, the, the key is to let it fall right here, okay, you, that, that bait falls. As it's falling, you're picking up slack. You don't wanna pick up that slack like this because now your line's tight, that bait's on the bottom. So in order for me to stroke that jig, if my line's tight and I hop that, I just pulled that bait. Not only did I jerk it so it's gonna go higher than what I pulled it, but I pulled my rod from here to here and I pulled the tension and I pulled that bait probably 20 or 40 feet. And I, at that point, I'm done. I'm out of the strike zone. 
If I get bit, I got lucky. So I want to get my rod right here. It's falling. I'm leaving it. I'm letting it fall. I'm keeping it tight. I'm keeping it tight. It hits. My line stops. I tighten it up. I drop my rod tip. Now my line's going all the way to the water. I'm going pop, pop. And I'm doing it hard. I mean, I'm snapping the crap out of this rod. People are looking at me down the lake like something's wrong with me. And uh, I'm, I'm watching that bait fall right here. I'm watching it fall. I'm keeping up. It hits the bottom. I grab my rod, pop, pop, real hard. Watch it fall. Now, the key to this technique right here is you got to pay attention. This isn't one where, this isn't like the smoke the cigarette deal. Where you smoke a cigarette and you're looking, trying to see if this whole buzzer's watching you over here. You got to pay attention to this deal right here. You're going to get bites pretty quick. If they're going to bite that jig doing this, you're going to catch them. It's going to be like that. Okay? So you got to pay attention because what happens is you pop, pop. And hey, my, <laughs> Michael, Michael can attest. He was with me, whatever, last week or so. And dude hooked the giant and never felt the fish. You don't feel it because bam, bam, that jig's way off the bottom. As, as it's falling, you're not paying attention, or you're not necessarily not paying attention, but you don't feel it. That fish grabs it, you don't know. Because you don't know, you gotta kinda, you gotta get a sense for how long it takes that bait to hit the water. You know, if you're fishing, um, you're fishing bridges, right? Anybody fish some of these underwater bridges out here? You make it, you're sitting up on the bridge, you make a cast, you watch that jig go down, you're one Mississippi, two Mississippi, all the way to 10 Mississippi. If you get to about 25 Mississippi and the bridge is in 10 foot of water, you don't miss the bridge, right? <laughs> So you gotta kinda pay attention to how long your bait's falling. So on this deal, it's important because you pop, pop. And most of the time, that fish is gonna hit it when it peaks on that, that hop. That fish is sitting there, that jig or, or bluegill jumps to get away and he swims straight up and grabs that thing. And you never feel it because your rod tip's right here and you got slacking line, you're watching it. And it doesn't go back down. So you keep up with that line as it's going down. And as soon as you, if, you're, if you're not sure, and there's a lot of times I'm not sure, especially on some of these Spots that I'm fishing that are hard as a freaking rock, man. I'm, I swear to goodness, I feel like we got rock in this lake sometimes. And I'm hitting the bottom, and I'm like, oh, is that a fish? And so I kind of just check up. I don't really want to move my bait if I don't have to. I really want this bait to kind of sit still, but I'll check up and check it, you know, just kind of give it a little pull, an inch or two. And if I feel some mush on it, man, I'm just, I'm going from right here straight back. I'm not going to drop my rod and give her slack or anything like that. I'm just going to bow up on her. So that's stroking a jig. That's a great technique, especially if I'm in these schools and, and if you guys will graph enough fish this week, you'll see some of these schools are, are just plastered to the bottom. And some of these schools are stacked up. And those schools that are stacked up and a little bit more erratic, that's a great technique. Or if you're fishing around those fish and they just won't bite, you can start stroking that jig and that'll get them to bite. Um, the other way is just to swim the jig. And Billy covered this last week, I think. And that's and I don't do this much out here. I mean, it's, it's a great technique. I call it the low fish. crawl. The low crawl. And it is a great technique and it catches a lot of fish. But it's just not something I do as much. And that's throwing it out there, letting it hit bottom, keeping your rod tip at 3 o'clock and I'll, swimming. I'll actually point mine all the way down. I'm trying to keep it as close gotcha. to the bottom as I can. And just slowly reel. And just as long as you can feel that jig, every second or third turn kind of bump the bottom as you're going through there, you're doing good. Um, now, the one time when that gets to be difficult to do is if you're fishing the top side of a structure, or if you're coming up and are fishing across the top, you'll feel that bottom contact. Every once in a while, as you're slowly reeling that big jig, it'll bounce. But when it comes on that downslope, it's just going to swing out off that downslope and you're not going to feel it. So if the fish are set up on the downslope and that's the way you have to fish them, that's a terrible tech. You don't yeah. want to do that technique. They need to be on top of the, the structure where you can keep it on the bottom. Otherwise, you're just going to cruise right over the fish. And, you're not and that's a good point. Anytime, okay, so let's talk about where I'm fishing. I'm fishing all this stuff on main lake points. By, by the way, that, that deal that he's just been talking about, he did a great job elaborating on it and trying to help you guys you know, realize and learn how to stay in touch with that jig when you're stroking it. When you're stroking the jig, the most difficult part about it, like, don't get too frustrated because you're probably going to screw some hook sets up in the beginning. Uh, I, I they still do this day. So hard, and they, they hit it, and you don't even know they got it, and then you go to stroke it, it's a fish, and you don't really get a good hook set on them. Like, if you can ever learn what he's talking about, where you kind of stay some, like, you're not, you're detached from it, but stay aware of your bait enough to where you can kind of start to know when they bite it on the fall. If you can get there, then you'll be really good at stroking a jig, but that is the most difficult part of stroking a jig. It's a great technique. It's tons of fun because sometimes they'll just hit it so hard they knock a bunch of slack in your line, and it's a big yeah. fish. It's a reaction. You'll get ride. backlashes. I mean, I've had tons of backlashes in my reel where that bait's falling, and it hits so hard yeah. that it knocks it knocks slack into my it's reel. It's a total reaction, but it's a great bite, but that is the hardest part about stroking a jig is learning how to stay in contact with that bait while it's on slack line. That's the hard part. And so here's a, here's a cool deal. Uh, I had a 15-year-old girl this week 
catch one almost 10 pounds, and it was a giant over stroking a jig. Um, and it was a spot that we weren't really getting that many bites. The bite had kind of slowed down a little bit, and she started hopping that jig. And a 15 year old girl, I mean, we're not talking about, you know, Kevin Van Dam over here, uh, but she ended up catching a giant, I mean, like a big fish that's gonna win a lot of money in this deal. So it's, it's a great technique. I wanted to elaborate on it because um, it's a really difficult technique. This is more of an advanced technique. And jig fishing, to me, is easy because I do it every day. And I got, a, I got a quick reminder on how hard some of this stuff can be when I went fly fishing at Broken Bow and just was horrible. Um, <laughs> it, it, that, that is a challenge that we face being out here every day is there's, there's a lot of little things that we, take that for we do. And I, the longer seems... I'm guiding, the more I realize that, you know, there's just little things that you pick up when you fish every single day um, that people don't, yeah. don't grasp. Sure, 100%. And, and they uh, make a big difference. They can be the difference yeah. between catching 20 and catching three. Right. And getting a school to fire and not to fire. Yes. So I'm fishing main lake points. I'm, I'm fishing long points and I'm fishing sharp drops. Um, I wish I could give you guys a really solid kind of idea of where these fish are. But man, I'm running literally, and I ain't kidding, I'm running from one end of the lake all the way to the other to catch, you know, 20 fish a day. Um, and I'll pull up on some spots and there might be 8 or 10 or 15 fish and I only catch 3 or 4. Um, but some sometimes you catch all of them. You know, we pulled up on school the other day. We figured eight or nine fish, and I think we caught like eleven, which was kind of weird. Cause that means old goofy one-eyed fish bit twice. But uh, like if Billy was a bass, he was in that school right there. <laughs> and uh, it's not possible that just a couple more swam into that school while you. <laughs> we there. just didn't see that relaxing yeah. over here. Yeah, that's not possible. <laughs> Are you a graph of these fish before you start? A hundred percent of the time. Now let me let me say this. Y <laughs> yes, because. Uh, yes and no. Yes, if I were fishing out here every once in a while, no, because I'm fishing seven days a week. So I've got some spots right now that they're just pinned and they're not moving, and there's zero other boats fishing it, and I can pull up and throw, you know, hey, throw right there. Um, but nine, nine out of ten times I'm graphing them. If I don't see them, man, I keep going. I mean, you know, we got an eight-hour fishing day, and we might only fish four hours, five hours in a fishing day. Um, and it kind of seems... You know, man, I'm going out there fishing. I'm only fishing for five hours. Well, you know. But when you stop, you catch them. Right. And you don't need any more casting practice. I mean, the other five hours of the day, usually you just cast and not catching. So might as well just riding a $60,000 luxury Skeeter boat with no trash can because I got the ZX and not the FX. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're so upset about, that. about the no trash can, man. That is garbage. That's why I carry that cooler in the back. Yeah. Um, so anyways, uh, I'm fishing long points. And now... I'm going to cut you guys in on something. Here's a here's a huge mistake anglers make when they're fishing offshore. So Billy's going to get into this more. Can I borrow your clipboard for just a second? I'll, I'll erase it. I'll just use a corner. Hurry up. <laughs> Getting trouble up here. So I'm going to I'm going to draw this real quick. So we got it. We got. Let's say this line's the bank. Can everybody kind of see this? I'll turn it around. But this line right here is the bank. And I got a main lake point on my graph that looks like this. Thank you, man. Okay. And I see these contours around here. You know, it's like this. Right here. Finally, somebody that draws as bad as I do. All right, so we got this long main lake point right here, okay? This is 15 foot. This is 18 foot. This is 32. This is 26. Are those not the most random numbers y'all have ever heard? <laughs> Shut up. Where'd that state trooper go? <laughs> so, right here. Uh, we might need him. Um, so most most of us, when we see this point right here, and we're getting ready to graph this point, we're gonna focus right in here, right? Would you agree? We got a we got a long main lake point. Everything kind of looks bland right through here, but right here I got a little point. It kind of tapers down. It makes a good little point. I'm gonna usually. I'm gonna run by and I'm gonna graph this and I'm gonna show you, this is gonna be my trail so I'm gonna mess it all up. I'm gonna drive up and I'm gonna graph it like this, all right? And then when I don't see them, I'm gonna wow and go hold jump somebody else, right? So I've missed this whole thing, right? So let's just say this is Walmart and this is your house and you're going to Walmart. Well, you gotta come through here to get to Walmart, okay? So there's a good chance if you're only this big and this is 300 yards, you might stop somewhere. 
So what's happening right now at Fork, and I'm I'm spilling the beans right here, Jack. <clears throat> All this is getting. I actually ignored. know where, what you're drawing. I don't know what spot that is. No, now. I've got like four spots like this. <laughs> so, like it's just going on all over the lake. So all this is getting ignored. Well, if I'm a bass and every time I get out here and I, I see football jig and I get caught, I might start thinking about some of this, right? So that's happening right here at Lake Fork a whole lot. Well, then you get the boat noise that's always on top of that that prime spot on the end. It's always there. I think I think boat motors can move them around, move them schools around. It's something else that we got to look at. We got to look at our graphs a little bit better. And Billy's about to get really in depth on this, and we got to look at our graphs better, and we got to pay attention to contour lines a little bit better. So I've got a three, four, five hundred yard long point, and I might have a forty or sixty foot section that drops a little bit steeper than the rest and those bass can hold up any subtle change those bass can hold up and uh michael fisherman today we saw it i mean like we saw it saw it and like we we found some fish today we couldn't not catch it they wouldn't they wouldn't spit our bait out and i'm like dude they're not nobody i mean everybody's going over there um and this is this is kind of a not a lot but five or six areas that are similar to this and so we're just kind of missing those in-between fish and so you want to pay attention to that especially if some of the other bait is starting to relate to that, bluegill, bait fish, stuff like that, you can have stumps, you can have crappie fishermen. Crappie fishermen try to stay away from bass fishermen. So they may not want to be on the end of the point, they may want to be backed up somewhere on the point, and they know crappie are different than bass. Bass kind of relate a little bit more to the to the structure than the cover, or to the cover than the structure, and bass are a little bit more on the structure than the cover. And so these, these crappie fishermen will sink brush piles, and I got one spot that's one of the biggest community holes in the lake, and there's two crappie brush piles, and ain't nobody fishing them. And we're catching big ones out of them. And um, so, so it's on a point, and they're not seeing it. And so we want to pay attention to that stuff. We don't want to just go to the very tip of the point, and it might take a while on some of these points. I mean, it might take 20 minutes. But if you find a school of 20 bass, then it's well worth it. You're not going down a bank casting, not catching anything. Um, but I'm fishing main lake points. Um, I'm graphing them first. That's a good question. I always graph them first. I mean, you're just if you can't if if you have the advantage, and I, and I know not everybody's got it, but most of us have the advantage of having pretty high quality. I mean, this there's 700 billion dollars. I don't know how you guys afford this crap. These boats out here are ridiculous, and we got all these you know graphs the size of TVs. We got to use them. We got to find the fish, hit waypoints on them. Um, if you're a hummingbird guy, you got the flags on your graph. It tells you how far you are away. I'm setting up on my fish about 70 foot away according to my graph um so that's 70 foot range i get a really good that's, cast uh, that's ironic that you do that because uh on the lorettes they don't have that same exact feature that you're talking about where it they tells have casting you how rings, far. Though. they have cast rings i don't even use those though what i do is on my front graph i zoom in to where my that little deal at the bottom mm -hmm. have y'all seen that little deal at the bottom that tells you how far this mm -hmm. amount of space is so i zoom in to where 50 foot's about that far and after, so I waypoint my fish, just like Rice, I do the same thing. Graph them, find the schools, waypoint them. And then I, I know what my 50 foot increment is roughly, and I get just on the edge of that, maybe just a little outside of it, not, but not closer than 50 foot. And I hit spot lock and I cast a little So we're basically doing the it's same good. exact thing. Yeah, and 65 to 80 foot is good, but that's 70, as long as that number <laughs> stays around seven. Because that spot lock, if you don't have spot lock, you can get it to not. Yeah, if that spot lock. It's gonna keep. You, it's gonna it's gonna move you about ten to fifteen foot, you know, in that little radius. But um, man, we're catching some good fish. This week has been absolutely awesome. We had three days where our best five. We were, both had a kid almost catch a ten pounder. Yeah, pounds. yeah. Both of us. It's been it's week. been crazy. The other bait, I'm, like I said, I'm throwing the the Magnum uh, Magnum Crawler by Smash Tech on the big Divine Shake yeah. head, which has been freaking on fire. Um, a lot of people catching a lot of fish on that, and that's a bait that just continues to get better the hotter it gets. I mean, it seems like that bait. It does. It really bait. does, especially with that big profile. They uh, I, it I don't stands know. up. Yeah. Stand. I don't know why they bought the thing. It doesn't look like it anything ever. It looks dumb, seen. but yeah. it works. Um, man, that's awesome. Who's got questions? Questions on the football jig. That's the best time to throw it. Right now. Uh, May through August. Yeah. Or um, during the day. Oh, during the day. First all thing, day. All day long. It can be uh, first thing in the morning. Like, I'm pulling up on schools first thing in the morning, and if they're there, I'm just throwing it. And, yeah, we're catching them. I mean, um, it now, I do still crank. If I've got a clean area, the problem is a lot of the areas I'm fishing aren't clean enough for me and two other people that aren't as experienced cranking the crank. 
you gotta you gotta be a, a you know you gotta be able to feel a lot to be able to throw that crankbait through brush and timber. You know, and I caught a couple nice fish yesterday on crankbait and stuff like that. But um, I think all day, man. I uh, um, I'm starting out throwing it. You know, okay. and I'm throwing it, and I'm really it's kind of all I'm throwing. You know, if if they stop, I might pick something else up, but um, that's that's about all I'm throwing. Rattle on a jig, or <laughs> I knew someone was gonna ask me that. So uh, that's just personal preference. I don't throw one. Um, I think it's you know I don't throw one. But I would encourage y'all to throw one. So they hear them rattles and they like them rattles. And they bite mine when they don't hear them rattles. No, I don't throw. <laughs> I don't throw rattles. I, I do a lot of stuff silent that most people do with noise on uh, on Lake Florida. And I throw a silent crankbait. About seven, silent seven crankbait. Uh, I don't put a I don't put a bead on a Carolina rig. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of things silent that most people put noise on mm-hmm. out here. And I, I'm just trying to be different because it's Lake Fork and there's a million boats out there. Any other questions? All right. Awesome. Well, hey, we can move over to the electronics side. You're going to stay around tonight, right? Sure. Stay around and help me out with this. All right.